hearts, I pray. We ask for God of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the living God, who is already welcome in this place yeah. to, manifest, to manifest himself powerfully and to talk to our hearts today, I pray. Yes. With the forgiveness and loss of our sins in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. The title of our sermon today is Unfinished Business. Mm. I don't know about you. But if you've lived long enough and you've experienced or been in this spiritual life long enough, you know that there are times, and I want to take some time to, to greet our brothers and sisters watching online. Uh, I'm sorry I forgot to do that earlier, but I, I greet you and I'm, I'm very happy to connect with you as, you as you are the only one who can see me and I cannot see you, but nonetheless, I certainly am I'm, uh, I'm happy to be with you and to connect with you. Now, going back to our purpose here, if you have been walking this Christian walk long enough, you know that there are things sometimes that transpire into your life that you thought was done with. That's true. You thought it was done. As a matter of fact, you may have received confirmation from the Lord that this may have been done with. That is, you were facing or you're going uphill to a mountain and God came through for you and after he comes through for you, you go on your merry way, you thinking and praise him for how he comes through for you. You even go before the saints and testify what God has done for you to find out a few months later what you thought was done with is actually still around. Oh, man. I'm speaking for you to you today from a place of a personal thing. Stuff that you thought was done, business that you thought was taken care of, because God intervened mightfully in this situation. But yet, a few weeks, a few months, maybe a year, a couple of years later, you find yourself facing the giant again. In your mind, you thought the giant was defeated. In your mind, everything was good. It may, be, it may have been a disease. It may have been cancer. It may have been a situation or anything else. But you find yourself pretty much almost back in the same, mm. in the same place yes. that you thought you were out of. Mm. Mercy. So you can connect today to the story in Exodus chapter 14, and we find ourselves now talking about the children of Israel after God has ordained or opened the way for them to finally leave Egypt after 400 and so years. In front of the people of God, now there was a bright future. In front of the people of God, now there was to be progress. As a matter of God, what God did for them in Egypt is what I will call the term theology of liberation. Because God liberated them out of Egypt. God came there with a mighty hand. God came there with a strong hand. And as he came there, we saw in the book of Exodus all the way to chapter 13 that God completely dismantled the, the system in Egypt in order to deliver his people. And I say he dismantled the system in Egypt because the system in Egypt was based on the slavery of God's people. Amen. So in order to take them out of that slavery, he had pretty much to dismantle the system and bring them out of Egypt. Amen. As there was a bright future and a new beginning starting for the people of God, things I believe were looking brighter. They didn't have to worry about waking in every day with the sound of whooping in their back. They didn't have to worry about how they were going to worship. They didn't have to worry about this many of things that they used to worry about of each because this was the beginning of a bright future. Amen. Things were looking bright. Better days were ahead as they are making their ways out of Egypt. 
Egypt, as they are leaving Egypt, leaving their past behind, leaving their 400 so years of misery behind, leaving their captivity behind. And after God, on that last draw that broke the camel's back, pulled them out of the situation. Amen. We find ourselves now in Exodus 14 where the enemy is saying, not so fast. Not so fast. Let me remind you that, that Egypt, still to this day, is a very focused point for people who practice occult sciences. People who are into the occult, that is, people who are the mystical arts of Egypt. Egypt is still, yes, it still plays a crucial role today in this particular world. That is people who are in the witchcraft or people who are in this demonic system, they still refer to Egypt, they still recognize Egypt as a centerpiece. So here we have now God's people walking out of Egypt, leaving Egypt, leaving the world behind, and yet we find ourselves in a situation where Pharaoh's saying, not so fast. Not so fast. You've been with me for 400 years, not so fast. You have been serving me for that long, yes. not so fast. So You've been in the system for so long, not so fast. You've been under my grip for that long, not so fast. You think you're trying to get away from me now, not so fast. You think you're going to have a better future than this, not so fast. You think you're going to pull up, walk out like it was nothing, not so fast. And the Bible tells us in our text today <coughs> as the people of God are leaving Egypt it seems for some reason that their past is not willing to let go of them. Their past is not willing to loosen its grip. But also I must tell you the one who was taking him out of Egypt knew what he was doing. The one who orchestrated their deliverance, the one who went ahead and selected a man to lead him, the one who trained this man for 40 years in the desert, had a plan in place from the beginning and knew exactly what he's doing. That's right. So the man or the person or the being who came through for them in Egypt, had a plan for a brighter future, and I'm excited to tell you there was gonna be anything, there was not gonna be a single thing to stand between God and what he wanted to do for his people, amen. amen. So the Bible tells us that in chapter 13, something really interesting to set up this text. The Bible tells me as the people are leaving Egypt, as God is leading them out of Egypt, God did something very particular. And I must dare say, it would seem to me that it is God who set him up. He right. <laughs> may be that it is God who set him up himself. Right. Now that's a very unpopular view. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at what the Bible said. Exodus chapter 13 reads. Let us read. Then it came to pass, verse 17, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistine, although this was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Mm -mm. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. It would seem to me 
There was a short way to get to God's destination. It would seem to me that was what would look like you and me, a quick way to get there. It would seem to me that God, instead of leading them that way, decided to take them to the way of the wilderness. It will seem to me that if there is a setup here, God is behind it. Amen. Amen. And the Bible continues and tells us in chapter 14, follow this here, because this is, the, this is setting up the context for the passage. Now the Lord spake to Moses and said, speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before by Harry Roth, between Megdal and the sea opposite Baal Zephon, you should camp before it by the sea, for Pharaoh will say, let's pay attention, of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land, the wilderness has closed them in. So, if you're not convinced by now that God set them up, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> because first of all, God took them by the way of the wilderness. Why? Lest they see war in the short way and do what? And change their minds. One, two. Here you're reading in Exodus 14 that we see very explicitly in the text. Are you with me? Are you with me, saints? We see explicitly in the text that God took him by the wilderness by the way of the, of the sea. So pretty much here, if it's not clear to you that God set him up, I don't know what is. Now, let's bring the discomfort to you. It is very possible that God is setting you up for something. It may not be comfortable. As a matter of fact, it will not be comfortable. But the reality is, God may be setting you up for something. You may say, God, this happened to me a few weeks ago. I thought this was done with. I thought this was over with. I thought history was As a matter of fact, God, I went before the saints and I went to testify and say how good you've been to me. Now I don't know how to go before the saints again because I don't see how I'm going to go before the saints and told them that the thing I testified to you that God did, apparently business wasn't done yet. So I'm a little bit embarrassed, Lord, to go before the saints because I had already testified what you had done for me. What am I going to say? Okay. I had already testified. Wait, that's it. What am I going to say? The saints already praised you. What am I going to say? Maybe yet nobody in this room have ever been in this situation. Good for you. I am. Good for you. I have. Me too. And I repeat, good for you. I am. So after testifying to the assembly of the saints and told them something wonderful that God has done for you. And we're not talking about you guessing that it is God who did. We're talking about God intervening and showing up on the way that only God can. Amen. Oh God. Amen. Amen. We're not talking about the Lord has opened ways, the Lord's supposed to have been acting behind the scene. Yes, the Lord can intervene and do things for you like that, but there are times it is clear, crystal clear that it is God Right. Who did it? Right. So I'm talking about these kinds of testimony where you went before the saints and you testify what the Lord has done for you, and this thing you testify about is coming right back. Yeah. Yeah. And mercy. Mm -hmm. Right back. And let's be real. Yes. You're like, I can't even go tell that to the saints. Mm -hmm. I already 
be justified. True. I may look like a phony. Mm -hmm. I don't want to mislead the saints. What am I to do? Mm -hmm. And you find yourself in a battle of your own. Amen. And you're like, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So, in the interesting part of in the story is God orchestrated it that very way. That's right, he did. If you can't accept that, that's fine with me. But I can't see it any other way. Mm -hmm. Let him out of Egypt, took the long way to the wilderness, mm -hmm. brought him right by the sea, uh -huh. and he said, Pharaoh's gonna come after them. Mm -hmm. If God ain't setting this up, who is? <laughs> if God ain't setting this up, who is? Now, if you find yourself in a situation where you're somewhat trapped like this, you already have testified to the saints. Mm -hmm. And yet, the demon is back. Mm. Yet, the principality is back. Mm. Yet, the devil is back. Yes. Yes. And you go, oh my world. Mm -hmm. oh. I thought I was done with this mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Goodness. Yes. And you go through a period when you ask God what in the world is going on. I know you came through for me with your mighty hands two weeks ago, a month ago, two years ago. And what is this mess doing here? I thought I was done with it. And God came through and he told Moses what will happen. My friends, when you find yourself in these kind of entrapment or scenarios or spiritual battle, how do you move on? Hmm. There is a sense of disappointment sometimes you feel inside. Let's tell the truth. Let's be real. There is a little bit sometimes a sense of disappointment. Why? Because you thought you were done with this. That's right. Tell me how you feel when you're dealing with something in, in secular affairs. For example, a bill that you paid a long time ago. In three years, they tell you you still have this bill you haven't paid. Mm -hmm. How do you feel when you get these news? And you know and you have proof you're done with this mess. Mm -hmm. Let's bring this down to the spiritual realms. We're not talking about you feeling what God has done. We're talking about what God has really showed you that he did. Okay. Yeah. And you're telling me you won't feel some level of disappointment? Hmm. You're not being real. That's right. You're not being real. So usually when something like that happens, first of all, there is a level of disappointment. I'm not telling you you're leaving God behind. I'm not there, no. I see you feel disappointed. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Let down. You feel let down. Yeah. You feel the Lord has exposed you. Yes. And even possibly exposed you to embarrassment because you don't find the strength to go before the saints to talk about that. Right. There was a sense of, what do I do? And this is when we find in the text God giving Moses specific instruction. Okay. As we read in the Bible, indeed Pharaoh decided to go back on his decision to go after the people of God. Mm -hmm. God decided that we had done something, uh, 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 something that was not going to work for us. Yeah, made uh, we made a mistake there. We, we, we should not, not let him go. Uh, but Pharaoh seemed to have forgotten.
find that his firstborn passed away right. as a result of his stubbornness. Pharaoh seemed to have forgotten the nine or ten plagues that hit him, befleeting him to that point. So at this stage, Pharaoh said, you know what? We snapped. We made a mistake. We made a fool fool. We're going to have to go back. So the Bible tells me that Pharaoh decided to get all that he's got in order to bring the children back to you. Now there's a spiritual thing going on here. Behind the scene now, in this text, you have the big controversy. Mm -hmm. Why? God delivered his people with a mighty hand, and the principalities of this time deciding, we ain't letting you go. Yet. Yes. And that's why, as you go through a situation like this, God help you realize that the only reason this is probably coming back it's because this wasn't over yet. Amen. I thought it was over. In my mind, it was over. I wanted it to be over. I prayed for it to be over. God gave me some times to relax. Maybe what, what I thought was over was a time to regroup, was a time to pick back up. It was a time to go on a little retreat because again, the second round is coming back. Sometimes in spiritual battle, you may have a first round. Sometimes in spiritual battle, you may have a second round. And I dare to say sometime in spiritual fight, you have a third round, and it can go as four or fifth round. But what's important is that, so you must remember, as you go through these rounds, you need God to give you spiritual discernment, because if you don't have spiritual discernment, you will misunderstand what God is doing and blame him for what he hasn't done because you misunderstood and you wanted a break and you wanted solution but God is looking for sanctification from you. Yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word. There is a first round. Yes. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us in Ephesians 16, we wrestle not. Right. Now, I'm not a fan of wrestling. Mm. Sorry for those of you who are. But I've seen wrestling. And when wrestling is not like boxing, mm. boxing you get rounds. Mm -hmm. But I've seen wrestling where the state keeps on going. The guys are like that watching Watching. They are like, oh, they swung on by the hand of the other boys. They are watching. It's because it's a wrestle. It's not boxing. Wrestle is very dirty. Yeah. Wrestle is very dirty. You watch it. And you gotta be slick. You gotta be slick. So when Paul says us we wrestle not, and when we take that text and put it in the context of Exodus 14, we saw that the devil was still wrestling. So sometimes what you think is deliverance may be a break before round two. And I must tell you the truth. The Lord, what I'm sharing with you is very personal. And I went through that stage where the Lord brought me to realize that this thing was not over yet. As a matter of fact, your, 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 the, the deliverance is a setup for a final deliverance. Just like the Bible tells you when Jesus came to planet Earth, he lived among us and he died for sin. But I understood though Jesus died for our sin, and the head of the serpent was bruised. Mm -hmm. But I also understand through the Bible, sin was not over with yet. Right. Sin has not been eliminated yet. Yeah. Why though Jesus claimed victory for us, mm -hmm. but the reality of sin is still here. Yeah. But we know there is a day that's coming. Yeah. And when that day comes, yeah. it will not be a partial victory yeah. because sin will be done with for forever. Yeah. And then we'll have what's called total deliverance. Praise God. So, it was a setup. It was a pause. 
before the battle resumed. And guess what? Israel didn't understand that. Israel didn't understand that. And the Bible gave instruction, and God gave instruction to Moses. And if you want to really see why the people didn't understand that, the Bible tells me when they saw the Egyptian coming, mm -hmm. they started complaining to Moses. Mm -hmm. They said to Moses, wasn't it better mm -hmm. that we stayed in Egypt? Mercy. We told you. Mercy. Yes. We told you. Mm -hmm. The Egyptian will never let you go. We told you. The Egyptians were going to come after us. Mm -hmm. We told you, the Egyptians were for real. We told you, the Egyptians never let go. They are like a pit bull. Once they bite you, they don't want to let you go easily. We told you. Mercy. You should have let it die. You should have let it die in Egypt. But here's the reality. When you get or I get deliverance many times, there is some level, especially at the stage, at their spiritual growth at this time, because they are spiritual babies at this stage. 400 years, no God, no real worship of God. So they are spiritual babies. Yeah, all right. And that's why you're gonna see that God didn't worry much about their reaction. He's simply giving directions to Moses. And also one thing you must understand at times, they had left Egypt, that's true. But so far Egypt was still in them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're talking 400 years, folks. Right. Mm -hmm. So they left Egypt physically, but they left with Egypt in them. Right. So therefore their reaction will be the Egyptian reactions. Right. Their thinking is Egyptian thinking. Mm -hmm. Their belly is Egyptian belly. Right. Because the food that they are thinking about are the food from the Egyptian. So everything about them in Egypt, as a matter of fact, they are only Israel by name. Right. They are simply Israel by name. Mm -hmm. So they know that's the fear many times that many experience of leaving the past, but being scared of the future. Right. Some folks will tell you, yes, we know what we have left, but we don't know what you're going to face, what we're going to face. Right. But one thing that you know is that you, should, you and I should never justify our past mm -hmm. and give up on our future. Right. Because we know our past wasn't that good. We ain't glorifying our past. We're looking forward to our future. Amen. To be complaining, the Bible says in Egypt, the chariots is coming after them. And Moses talked, God talked to Moses, and Moses in return talked to the people and said in verse 13. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which it will accomplish for you today. What did he tell them? Do not be afraid. So it was fear. Do not be afraid. Stand still. Here's the situation. Why did he tell him stand still? Well, there was water in front of them. They don't know how to swim. In my mind. So therefore, the tendency will be to do what? To go back. So Moses told them, stand still. That means, don't move. Don't move. Don't move a finger. Don't move a toe. Don't move. Because 
at the juncture at the, at the impasse that they were. To go was only one direction, was to go back. They can't move forward because of the water. They are already complaining to Moses about what they are about to go through. Yeah. Or they are complaining to Moses about the, about the sense that it made for, for them to come out of Egypt because they didn't make any sense to leave Egypt and come and die here. Mm -hmm. So Moses told them specifically, first of all, don't fear. Second of all, stand still. Now, he continues. And he said what? Watch the salvation that the Lord is about to give to you today. Now, do not be afraid. In other words, relax. In other words, get a grip of your faith. Get a grip of yourself. It's not the first time you've seen Egypt. It's not the first time you've seen what I've done in Egypt. As a matter of fact, I don't know why, or I'm not sure, I'm not too sure why I should say Moses had to tell him to not fear. Because if we take a little review, if we take a little return into what God had done in Egypt, these people have had every confidence in the world right. mm -hmm. to not fear. Right. Amen. But nonetheless, Moses said, don't fear. And he said, what? Stand still. That means don't move a finger back. Don't even think Go about ahead. going back. Right. Three, and watch your salvation. That is Amen. the salvation that you about to that you that you are getting now was a salvation. The salvation that you are going to experience now, I should say, is a salvation that started on the very first day when Exodus three told me God heard the groaning, God heard the cries of His people in Egypt. As a result of God hearing the cries, he sets up a servant who has been putting in training for about 40 years. As the 40 years of training was done, he pulled the spin out of training. He pulled the spin out of his bachelor's. And he told the spin, now, I'm going to sign you up for the PhD. I'm going to sign you up for the master's. Because you've been in isolation getting trained. Now I'm going to put you into internship. Yeah. All that you've been learning in the 40 years in the desert, now you're going to learn more, but you're going to learn to practice. So as God took Moses and put him and sent them to Egypt, we saw God coming with the first plague, God coming with the second plague, God coming with the third plague, God coming with the fourth, with the fifth, with the seventh, with the eighth, with the nine, with the ten. That means that very God who started the salvation in Egypt, that very God was not done, but that very God is about to finish what he has started in the name of Jesus. Amen. He's about to finish. So if you find yourself in a situation similar to this, first of all, you may ask, why me? That's the wrong question. Yeah. Why not you? Okay. Why me is the wrong question. Well, why not? Mm. Aren't you a child of God? Right. Aren't you a child of the King? Yes. Haven't you been saved by grace? Yes. Haven't Jesus died for you? Yes. Why not you? Why not? Right. Mm. Why not you? I've returned my tithe and offering. I've been faithful in coming to prayer meeting. I've been faithful in doing missionary work. I've been faithful in serving in church office. I've been faithful this. I've been faithful that. That doesn't matter because why not you? Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Why not you? Why not? And why not me? So that salvation that started in Egypt wasn't quite completed yet. So Moses told them now, see the salvation that the Lord is about to give. So he went ahead and said, the Egyptians that you're seeing now, you will never see them again. 
And that's why business is going to finally be finished. Some of you again sitting here are some unfinished business of battles that needs to be finished. But you may be the one slowing it down because you may be stuck at the stage of denial where you are asking, is that really me? Where you are asking, why is it me? But you need to remember that what God started for you some years ago, what God started working through you some months ago, you thought was complete, but it's not over yet. And God is standing waiting for you. God is telling you to stand still. God is telling you to watch the deliverance. God is telling you to do not fear. For me who has taken you, I who have taken you in the past. I who has taken care of your family. I who have healed your daughter, your son. I who have taken care of you in past time. I surely am able, I surely will take care of you now as well. Starts things and don't finish it. For he is the starter and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. When he starts, he will finish. That's yes. It. yes, he will. Amen. So therefore, what Moses did here to the people is spoke words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. Give him confidence. That God is not done yet. Amen. Where do you get your confidence? Mm. Where things do not turn the way you would want or you would hope. Mm. Do you turn your confidence to God? Mm. Or do you call your friends to complain? Mm. That how the Lord let me down. Mm. How the Lord didn't treat me right in this situation. What do you do? And as we close, the Bible told me after all the instructions were given, there was a shift that happened in the situation. How? What do you mean, Brother Freddy? Verse 19. And he said, and the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind. Mm -hmm. Y'all don't get this. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Bible said there was what? A pillar of cloud. Wow. Wow. And there was a pillar of fire, fire leading them day and night. Amen. And they could see these as they were walking in there. Mm -hmm. So it is these pillars when the Bible tells us that the angel of God, they refer to these pillars that move behind them and we continue. And the pillar of what? Of cloud went From where? Them. Before them. And stood behind them, so it came between the camp of the Egyptian and the camp of Israel. Of Israel. Yeah, that's right. So after instructions was given, after affirmation of faith was given, after confidence was boosted to the man of God in the Word of God, then God moved. God moved. Oh, I pray today that God is moving for somebody today. Amen. God is moving for somebody in a situation like this. God is moving for somebody. You must as well say where you are. God, move for me, Father. Move. Let's go. Let's go. Move, Lord. Move for me. Move on the life of my children. Move in my life, my Lord. Move in the life of my niece. Move in the life of my wife. Move for me, Lord. Move. powerful when you're in scripture and you pray in scripture. There is something powerful in praying scripture. You open the scripture and where the spirit leads you applies to you pray that. Amen. That is praying in scripture and you can't be wrong. Amen. You pray in scripture. Amen. Scripture is the word of God. That's right. You're repeating to God his own words. What he said. You say it and you put the faith in it and you take it. So when you say, move for me, God, move for my sister, God, move for my daughters, move for my three children, move for my wife, Lord, move for my business, Lord, move for Brother Moncrief, Lord, who is sick, move 
for brother housing lord move you start calling names of the people that the lord put upon your heart asking the lord to move from them and you must believe as you do it that something is happening in the spiritual realm where god at this time in jesus name may be delegating an angel to move at this time where the person may find themselves they may feel something different or they may not feel something different but god dispatches an angel to come to the rescue at this time because at the time you call somebody names in prayer you don't know why you call that name but god impress that name upon your mind because this person needs spiritual intervention at this time amen 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 that moved from the for them. That's true. And it's got moved for them. We know the rest of the story. And he told Moses, and Moses the Bible told us, lift up his hand. Yes. And I've told you that before. There are gestures in the Bible that speaks very loud in the spiritual world. I've told you that before. There is verbal communication in life. Mm -hmm. There is also non-verbal communication in this, uh, in, in this life we live. Yes. But in the spiritual realm, there is of course verbal talk. That's when we pray loudly. Uh -huh. But there is also non-verbal talk. That's, right. That's when we do a gesture. Yes. If in this place, in this realm where we live in this planet, I can look like this and people know I'm not. I can have my teeth out and people understand I'm happy. Why would you want me to believe that in the spiritual realm, nonverbal communication doesn't work? <laughs> Careful. Yeah. The Bible says the spirit can interpret our whispers. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. Somebody who says, mm. Mm. He knows. Yes, right. What is that? Nonverbal. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Use your Bible proof now. In your tears. In your tears. That's right. Yes. Here you go. Yes. So in the spiritual realm, you have nonverbal communication and you have verbal as well. Yes. Amen. So the Bible tells me Moses lifted up his hand. Yes. And the last time I was here, or the last couple that I told you with the lifting up in the, of the hand, if you know what you're doing, and you know why you are doing it, and I've many times my daughter or my children have been sick, I rose up a hand into the heaven, and I put another hand upon them, and I asked the Lord by his grace to transfer healing virtue, to transfer other virtues, spiritual virtues from him is thrown to them that are sleeping. That's right. Yes. So there is strength, yes. power in nonverbal communication. Yes. That's right. the truth. Yes. And we know how the story ends. Hmm. Pharaoh followed them to the yes. sea, yes. but Pharaoh followed them to his death. Yes. Yes. There is a setup that God does. And as he opened the way for you to walk through, and as you walk through, the enemy will follow you. But the enemy will follow you to its demise, to its death. Because there is a way that the God is taking his children, and the enemy is trying to follow the child of God through that way. But that way will be the way of prayer for the enemy. Yes. So the way that the Lord is walking you now, you may say, elder or brother, the, the, end of the enemy is following me. I know, and I can understand that. In this what? Look at me. He must follow you. He must. He must follow you. But you're going to watch and you're going to see the salvation that the Lord has in store for you. And you thought the praise that you gave before was high.
high praise? Wait for the praise that you're going to give after that deliverance. Wait for the testimony that you're going to give after that deliverance. Wait for the honor, the praise, the glory that you're going to give after that deliverance. Because after that deliverance, business will be finished for real. Amen. And the Bible tells me that Moses sung or composed a song of praise in Exodus chapter 15. Now, in Revelation, the Bible talks about what? The song of Moses and the Lamb. Now, that is the song of what? That's the song of final deliverance. That's the song of total deliverance. But the song that we see in Exodus 15 is not the song of Tolu, uh, it's not the song of the global deliverance, but it was a song of a total deliverance for that time. Yes. Yes. I pray and pray and prophesy upon your life that God gives you your song of deliverance. Yeah. Accept it that God gives you your song of deliverance. Say amen. amen. God gives you your song of deliverance. And you take that song of deliverance. It may be a song that the Lord impresses upon your mind. It can be the song that say, Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. It can be of any other song that the Lord places upon your heart. But God will give you your song of deliverance. Because God's name must be praised. Amen. And the business which he started for you and for me, he will finish. Because God is no quitter. God bless you. Amen.